Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening. This afternoon, <clears throat> we're going to be looking at uh, the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, chapter 4 and uh, <clears throat> kind of wrapping up a, a section of the Gospel that is, uh, I think, one of the most uh, remarkable portions of scripture that I've personally ever read. <clears throat> I've got my cup of tea. You might need something stronger, maybe an espresso for this lecture. Um, or maybe you need a cup of tea brewed like the White Witch of Narnia. She always brewed it, steep it for six minutes. Uh, my grandmother was strict on three minutes maximum take the tea out, and then it's ready. If you let it go any longer than that, you are an ogre. Well, be that as it may, we are in a, a section of Matthew, chapter 4 now, that is moving us out of the, out of the um, structure that I'm so fond of, and moving us out now into the ministry life of Jesus. And we're going to be looking at the section today that uh, involves the calling of Peter and Andrew and James and John uh, from their fishing nets into the task of discipleship. We are going to look First, though, at what we've already covered by way of reviewing it. Matthew chapter 3 begins with John the Baptist preaching, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that begins what I consider one literary unit, which ends in chapter 4, verse 17, when Jesus begins to preach, Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I've suggested to you that when you see the repetition of two identical phrases like that, separated uh, by a, a story or a group of stories, then uh, what you have is uh, a literary inclusio or a, 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 a bracketing, if you will. And so Imagine that that repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand is a is a literary parentheses mark. And so John says it, and then later Jesus says it, and you know that what's in between is one unit. It's like an Irish tale well told, where you uh, tell the story of a man, two cows and a woman who had her wits about her. And then the story is told, and you find out how the two cows and the woman who had her wits about her fit into the play. And then at the end of the story, again, the two cows and the woman who had her wits about her are uh, included. That is what Matthew does. He's not an Irishman, but he's a good storyteller. And so he has this bracketing. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And in between those two brackets is the story of Jesus's baptism. And then outside of that is the story of John's confrontation with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, uh, and you see there the word stones brought up. Uh, John warns that brood of vipers not to be confident because they are descended from Abraham, because God could raise up children to Abraham from these stones. But then after the baptism, Jesus is tempted by 
the devil in the wilderness, and the tempter tempts him with stones. If you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. And so if you can uh, use your imagination a bit, you have this outer bracket, which is repent, repent. And then you have an inner bracket, which is stones, stones. <laughs> the first stones mentioned when the brood of vipers is in confrontation with John. The second mention of stones comes when the original snake, Satan, is in conflict with uh, Jesus. And then between the outer bracket and the inner bracket, there's another bracket, which involves two prophecies by the same prophet. But one refers to John the baptizer, and the other refers to Jesus. And so you have John, 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 and then you have Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And so you come into this section with John the Baptist, and you leave it with Jesus, but the message remains the same. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Same song, different singer. And from there on, uh, the voice of John the Baptist will begin to fade away, and the boy voice of Jesus Christ will become louder and louder, because this is the gospel according to St. Matthew, but it's the good news of Jesus, the Messiah, not the good news of John, the baptizer. Well, that is a brief summary. Uh, of the structure that we're leaving to enter this next section after we uh, depart from verse 17, things will change. And um, the other thing that I would like to mention by way of review is something that we sometimes uh, neglect to talk about uh, when we are preaching and teaching. Uh, oftentimes we'll use the scriptures to teach a moral lesson to the young, or in some cases to the old. And um, we will talk about the consequence of yielding to temptation. Uh, remember the, the second part of the story after Jesus's baptism is the story of Jesus's temptation in the wilderness. And I can remember one uh, preacher uh, that I liked very well when I was young. His name was Adrian Rogers. Had a kind of a deep, uh, I don't know where he was from, sounded like Memphis. Uh, kind of a historic southern uh, genteel drawl. And uh, he used to say, sin will always take you further than you wanted to go. Keep you there longer than you wanted to stay and cost you there more than you wanted to pay. And so he would discourage us from sinning by talking about the consequences of yielding to temptation. That's a very expensive choice. But what we sometimes leave out is the reward of resisting temptation. And so uh, as we move out of the temptation section and into the ministry of Jesus now, we want to first observe one result of his resistance to temptation. You'll remember that the third temptation, as Matthew arranges it, is the ultimate kind of the ultimate temptation, at least in this section of Scripture. Satan will return again. He leaves Jesus for a time. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. But that doesn't mean he's never coming back. But what Satan offered Jesus in the final temptation was all of the kingdoms of the earth. If you would simply bow down and worship him. And Jesus flatly refuses, tells him in words very similar to the baptismal vows in a historic church, where we, we must say that we renounce the devil and all his ways. Well, Jesus 
flatly renounces the devil, tells him, get out of here, Satan. Um, go away. Because it is written. That is, the scripture that is written says uh, that we are only to worship the Lord our God. And so Satan departs and angels come and minister to Jesus. And that must have been uh, a dainty banquet that Jesus enjoyed there. I'm sure they brought him all of his favorite things to eat and drink and a nice uh, dessert on top of it. But that's not the reward I'm talking about. That reward came immediately following Jesus' resisting Satan for the third time. But at the very end of Matthew, there is a piece which we must put together with that temptation story. Because in Matthew chapter 28, down around verse 18, Jesus is speaking to the disciples and he tells them, All authority on earth? No. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And this is the conclusion of the temptation of Jesus. Because Jesus was offered all the kingdoms of the earth by Satan if he would yield to Satan's will. Jesus chose rather to yield to the will of his heavenly Father and him alone. And the consequence of that resistance was that Jesus was made Lord, that Jesus was given authority over heaven and earth. Not just what Satan had offered, but much more. And there you have perhaps the basis of one of C.S. Lewis's famous sayings, which is that when we aim at earth, we get neither earth nor heaven. But when we aim at heaven, we get earth thrown in as well. Resist the devil, and he will flee. Resist the devil, and there will be a reward. And the reward is likely to be a much greater reward than you were offered by the other side. Because the other side has limited resources and is not particularly known for keeping its word anyway. But the Heavenly Father has unlimited resources. And when we rely upon his word, he typically has more in store for us than we could have imagined. And the, the key that unlocks that reward is trust and obedience. Trust and obey, the children's song says, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Well, I hope that as we look forward now to talking about the life and ministry of Jesus in the rest of chapter 4, that this has been a good review of what we've learned so far. See you next time.